Hello friends, I'm Ellie, welcome to Cardboard Design. Today, I will tell you meaningful fairy tales. Fairy tales will bring you valuable lessons in life. Let's listen together. The first fairy tale, Iron John. There was once on a time a king who had a great forest near his palace, full of all kinds of wild animals. One day, he sent out a huntsman to shoot him a row, but he did not come back. Perhaps some accident has befallen him, said the king. And the next day, he sent out two more huntsmen who were to search for him, but they too stayed away. Then on the third day, he sent for all his huntsmen and said, Scour the whole forest through and do not give up until ye have found all three. But of these also, none came home again and of the pack of hounds which they had taken with them, none were seen more. From that time forth, no one would any longer venture into the forest, and it lay there in deep stillness and solitude, and nothing was seen of it but sometimes an eagle or a hawk flying over it. This lasted for many years, when a strange huntsman announced himself to the king as seeking a situation, and offered to go into the dangerous forest. The king, however, would not give his consent, and said, it is not safe in there. I fear it would fare with thee no better than with the others, and thou wouldst never come out again. The huntsman replied, Lord, I will venture it at my own risk, of fear I know nothing. The huntsman therefore betook himself with his dog to the forest. It was not long before the dog fell in with some game on the way, and wanted to pursue it, but hardly had the dog run two steps when it stood before a deep pool, could go no farther, and a naked arm stretched itself out of the water, seized it, and drew it under, when the huntsman saw that. He went back and fetched three men to come with buckets and bail out the water. When they could see to the bottom there lay a wild man whose body was brown like rusty iron, and whose hair hung over his face down to his knees. They bound him with cords, and led him away to the castle. There was great astonishment over the wild man. The king, however, had him put in an iron cage in his courtyard, and forbade the door to be opened on pain of death, and the queen herself was to take the key into her keeping. And from this time forth, everyone could again go into the forest with safety. The king had a son of eight years, who was once playing in the courtyard, and while he was playing, his golden ball fell into the cage. The boy ran thither and said, Give me my ball out. Not till thou hast opened the door for me. Answered the man. No, said the boy. I will not do that. The king has forbidden it. And ran away. The next day he again went and asked for his ball. The wild man said, Open my door. But the boy would not. On the third day the king had ridden out hunting. And the boy went once more and said, I cannot open the door even if I wished, for I have not the key. Then the wild man said, It lies under thy mother's pillow. Thou canst get it there. The boy, who wanted to have his ball back, cast all thought to the winds and brought the key. The door opened with difficulty, and the boy pinched his fingers. When it was opened, the wild man stepped out, gave him the golden ball, and hurried away. The boy had become afraid. He called and cried after him. Oh, wild man, do not go away, or I shall be beaten. The wild man turned back, took him up, set him on his shoulder, and went with hasty steps into the forest. When the king came home, he observed the empty cage and asked the queen how that had happened. She knew nothing about it and sought the key, but it was gone. She called the boy, but no one answered. The king sent out people to seek for him in the fields, but they did not find him. Then he could easily guess what had happened, and much grief reigned in the royal court. When the wild man had once more reached the dark forest, he took the boy down from his shoulder and said to him, Thou wilt never see thy father and mother again, but I will keep thee with me, for thou hast set me free, and I have compassion on thee. If thou dost all I bid thee, thou shalt fare well. Of treasure and gold have I enough, and more than anyone in the world. He made a bed of moss for the boy on which he slept. And the next morning the man took him to a well and said, Behold, the gold well is as bright and clear as crystal. Thou shalt sit beside it, and take care that nothing falls into it, or it will be polluted. 
I will come every evening to see if thou hast obeyed my order. The boy placed himself by the margin of the well, and often saw a golden fish or a golden snake show itself therein, and took care that nothing fell in. As he was the city, his finger hurt him so violently that he involuntarily put it in the water. He drew it quickly out again, but saw that it was quite gilded, and whatsoever pains he took to wash the gold off again, all was to no purpose. In the evening Iron John came back, looked at the boy, and said, what has happened to the well? Nothing, nothing. He answered, and held his finger behind his back, that the man might not see it. But he said, Thou hast dipped thy finger into the water. This time it may pass. But take care thou dost not again let anything go in. By daybreak the boy was already sitting by the well and watching it. His finger hurt him again, and he passed it over his head and then unhappily a hair fell down into the well. He took it quickly out, but it was already quite gilded. Iron John came, and already knew what had happened. Thou hast let a hair fall into the well! Said he. I will allow thee to watch by it once more. But if this happens for the third time, then the well is polluted, and thou canst no longer remain with me. On the third day, the boy sat by the well, and did not stir his finger, however much it hurt him. But the time was long to him, and he looked at the reflection of his face on the surface of the water. And as he still bent down more and more while he was doing so, and trying to look straight into the eyes, his long hair fell down from his shoulders into the water. He raised himself up quickly, but the whole of the hair of his head was already golden and shone like the sun. You may imagine how terrified the poor boy was. He took his pocket handkerchief and tied it round his head, in order that the man might not see it. When he came, he already knew everything, and said, Take the handkerchief off! Then the golden hair streamed forth, and let the boy excuse himself as he might. It was of no use. Thou hast not stood the trial, and canst stay here no longer. Go forth into the world, there thou wilt learn what poverty is. But as thou hast not a bad heart, and as I mean well by thee, there is one thing I will grant thee if thou fallest into any difficulty. Come to the forest and cry, Iron John, and then I will come and help thee. My power is great, greater than thou thinkest, and I have gold and silver in abundance. Then the king's son left the forest and walked by beaten and unbeaten paths ever onwards until at length he reached a great city. There he looked for work but could find none, and he had learnt nothing by which he could help himself. At length he went to the palace and asked if they would take him in. The people about court did not at all know what use they could make of him, but they liked him and told him to stay. At length the cook took him into his service and said he might carry wood and water and rake the cinders together. Once when it so happened that no one else was at hand, the cook ordered him to carry the food to the royal table, but as he did not like to let his golden hair be seen, he capped his little cap on, such a thing as that had never yet come under the king's notice, and he said, When thou comest to the royal table, thou must take thy head off. He answered, Ah, oh, Lord, I cannot. I have a bad sore place on my head. Then the king had the cook called before him and scolded him and asked how he could take such a boy as that into his service, and that he was to turn him off at once. The cook, however, had pity on him, and exchanged him for the gardener's boy. And now the boy had to plant and water the garden, hoe and dig, and bear the wind and bad weather. Once in summer when he was working alone in the garden, the day was so warm he took his little cap off that the air might cool him. As the sun shone on his hair it glittered and flashed so that the rays fell into the bedroom of the king's daughter, and up she sprang to see what that could be. Then she saw the boy, and cried to him, Boy, bring me a wreath of flowers. He put his cap on with all haste, and gathered wild field flowers and bound them together. When he was ascending the stairs with them, the gardener met him, and said, How canst thou? Take the king's daughter a garland of such common flowers. Go quickly, and get another, and seek out the prettiest and rarest. Oh no, replied the boy. The wild ones have more scent, and will please her better. 
When he got into the room, the king's daughter said, Take thy cap off! It is not seemly to keep it on in my presence! He again said, I may not, I have a sore head. She, however, caught at his cap and pulled it off, and then his golden hair rolled down on his shoulders, and it was splendid to behold. He wanted to run out, but she held him by the arm and gave him a handful of ducats. With these he departed, but he cared nothing for the gold pieces. He took them to the gardener and said, I present them to thy children, they can play with them. The following day the king's daughter again called to him that he was to bring her a wreath of field flowers, and when he went in with it, she instantly snatched at his cap and wanted to take it away from him, but he held it fast with both hands. She again gave him a handful of ducats, but he would not keep them, and gave them to the gardener for playthings for his children. On the third day, things went just the same. She could not get his cap away from him, and he would not have her money. Not long afterwards, the country was over and by war. The king gathered together his people, and did not know whether or not he could offer any opposition to the enemy, who was superior in strength and had a mighty army. Then said the gardener's boy, I am grown up, and will go to the wars also, only give me a horse. The others laughed, and said, Seek one for thyself when we are gone, we will leave one behind us in the stable for there. When they had gone forth, he went into the stable, and got the horse out. It was lame of one foot, and limped hobbledy jig, hobbledy jig, nevertheless he mounted it, and rode away to the dark forest. When he came to the outskirts, he called, Iron John? three times so loudly that it echoed through the trees. Thereupon the wild man appeared immediately, and said, What dost thou desire? I want a strong steed, for I am going to the wars. That thou shalt have, and still more than thou askest for. Then the wild man went back into the forest, and it was not long before a stable boy came out of it, who led a horse that snorted with its nostrils, and could hardly be restrained and behind them followed a great troop of soldiers entirely equipped in iron, and their swords flashed in the sun. The youth made over his three-legged horse to the stable boy, mounted the other, and rode at the head of the soldiers. When he got near the battlefield a great part of the king's men had already fallen, and little was wanting to make the rest give way. Then the youth galloped thither with his iron soldiers, broke like a hurricane over the enemy, and beat down all who opposed him. They began to fly, but the youth pursued, and never stopped, until there was not a single man left. Instead, however, of returning to the king, he conducted his troop by byways back to the forest, and called forth Iron John. What dost thou desire? Asked the wild man. Take back thy horse and thy troops, and give me my three-legged horse again. All that he asked was done, and soon he was riding on his three-legged horse. When the king returned to his palace, his daughter went to meet him, and wished him joy of his victory. I am not the one who carried away the victory, said he, but a stranger knight who came to my assistance with his soldiers. The daughter wanted to hear who the strange knight was, but the king did not know, and said, He followed the enemy, and I did not see him again. She inquired of the gardener where his boy was, but he smiled and said, He has just come home on his three-legged horse. And the others have been mocking him and crying. Here comes our home lady Jake back again. They asked too. Under what edge hast thou been lying sleeping all the time? He, however, said, I did the best of all, and it would have gone badly without me. And then he was still more ridiculed. The king said to his daughter, I will proclaim a great feast that shall last for three days, and thou shalt grow a golden apple. Perhaps the unknown will come to it. When the feast was announced, the youth went out to the forest and called Iron John. What dost thou desire? Asked he. That I may catch the king's daughter's golden apple. It is as safe as if thou hadst it already, said Iron John. Thou shalt likewise have a suit of red armor for the occasion, and ride on a spirited chestnut horse. When the day came, the youth galloped to the spot, took his place amongst the knights, and was recognized by no one. The king's daughter came forward, 
and threw a golden apple to the knights, but none of them caught it but he. Only as soon as he had it he galloped away. On the second day, Iron John equipped him as a white knight, and gave him a white horse. Again, he was the only one who caught the apple, and he did not linger an instant, but galloped off with it. The king grew angry, and said, That is not allowed. He must appear before me and tell his name. He gave the order that if the knight who caught the apple should go away again, they should pursue him. And if he would not come back willingly, they were to cut him down and stab him. On the third day, he received from Iron John a suit of black armor and a black horse, and again he caught the apple. But when he was riding off with it, the king's attendants pursued him, and one of them got so near him that he wounded the youth's leg with the point of his sword. The youth nevertheless escaped from them, but his horse leapt so violently that the helmet fell from the youth's head, and they could see that he had golden hair. They rode back and announced this to the king. The following day, the king's daughter asked the gardener about his boy. He is at work in the garden. The queer creature has been at the festival too and only came home yesterday evening. He has likewise shown my children three gold and apples which he has won. The king had him summoned into his presence and he came and again had his little cap on his head. But the king's daughter went up to him and took it off and then his golden hair fell down over his shoulders and he was so handsome that all were amazed. Art thou the knight who came every day to the festival, always in different colors, and who caught the three golden apples? Asked the king. Yes. Answered he. And here the apples are. And he took them out of his pocket, and returned them to the king. If you desire further proof, you may see the wound which your people gave me when they followed me, but I am likewise the knight who helped you to your victory over your enemies. If thou canst perform such deeds as that, thou art no gardener's boy, tell me who is thy father. My father is a mighty king, and gold have I in plenty as great as I require. I will see, said the king, that I owe thanks to thee. Can I do anything to please thee? Yes, answered he. That indeed you can. Give me your daughter to wife. The maiden laughed and said, he does not stand much on ceremony, but I have already seen by his golden hair that he was no gardener's boy. And then she went and kissed him. His father and mother came to the wedding, and were in great delight, for they had given up all hope of ever seeing their dear son again. And as they were sitting at the marriage feast, the music suddenly stopped, the doors opened, and a stately king came in with a great retinue. He went up to the youth, embraced him, and said, I am Iron John, and was by enchantment a wild man. But thou hast set me free. All the treasures which I possess shall be thy property. The story emphasizes the importance of evaluating individuals not based on external appearances or social status. People often judge and make assumptions about others based on their physical appearance. But in this case, a person from the forest with a distinct appearance and behavior turns out to be compassionate and noble. The young man not only provides assistance to those in need, but also aids the king in overcoming his enemies. This highlights the value of compassion and the significance of helping others in society. The young man consistently keeps his promise to Iron Hans. This loyalty helps him achieve the things he desires and underscores the importance of keeping one's word. The Second Fairy Tale the White Bride and the Black One A woman was going about the unenclosed land with her daughter and her stepdaughter cutting fodder, when the Lord came walking towards them in the form of a poor man, and asked, Which is the way into the village? If you want to know, said the mother, Seek it for yourself. And the daughter added, If you are afraid you will not find it, take a guide with you. But the stepdaughter said, Poor man, I will take you there, come with me. Then God was angry with the mother and daughter, and turned his back on them, and wished that they should become as black as night and as ugly as sin. To the poor stepdaughter, however, God was gracious, and went with her, and when they were near the village, he said a blessing over her, and spake, Choose three things for thyself, and I will grant them to thee. Then said the maiden, 
I should like to be as beautiful and fair as the sun. And instantly she was white and fair as day. Then I should like to have a purse of money which would never grow empty. That the Lord gave her also, but he said, Do not forget what is best of all. Said she, For my third wish, I desire, after my death, to inhabit the eternal kingdom of heaven. That also was granted unto her, and then the mm -hmm. Lord left her. When the stepmother came home with her daughter, and they saw that they were both as black as coal and ugly, but that the stepdaughter was white and beautiful, wickedness increased still more in their hearts, and they thought of nothing else but how they could do her an injury. The stepdaughter, however, had a brother called Reginer, whom she loved much, and she told him all that had happened. Once on a time Reginer said to her, Dear sister, I will take thy likeness, that I may continually see thee before mine eyes. For my love for thee is so great that I should like always to look at thee. Then she answered, But I pray thee let no one see the picture. So he painted his sister and hung up the picture in his room. He, however, dwelt in the king's palace, for he was his coachman. Every day he went and stood before the picture, and thanked God for the happiness of having such a dear sister. Now it happened that the king whom he served had just lost his wife, who had been so beautiful that no one could be found to compare with her. And on this account the king was in deep grief. The attendants about the court, however, remarked that the coachman stood daily before this beautiful picture, and they were jealous of him, so they informed the king. Then the latter ordered the picture to be brought to him, and when he saw that it was like his lost wife in every respect, except that it was still more beautiful, he fell mortally in love with it. He caused the coachman to be brought before him, and asked whom the portrait represented. The coachman said it was his sister, so the king resolved to take no one but her as his wife, and gave him a carriage and horses and splendid garments of cloth of gold, and sent him forth to fetch his chosen bride. When Reginer came on this errand, his sister was glad, but the black maiden was jealous of her good fortune, and grew angry above all measure, and said to her mother, of what use are all your arts to us now when you cannot procure such a piece of luck for me? Be quiet, said the old woman. I will soon divert it to you. And by her arts of witchcraft, she so troubled the eyes of the coachman that he was half blind, and she stopped the ears of the white maiden so that she was half deaf. Then they got into the carriage, first the bride in her noble royal apparel, then the stepmother with her daughter, and Reginer sat on the box to drive. When they had been on the way for some time, the coachman cried, Cover thee well, my sister dear, that the rain may not wet thee, that the wind may not load thee with dust, that thou mayst be fair and beautiful, when thou appearest before the king. The bride asked, What is my dear brother saying? Ah, oh, said the old woman, he says that you ought to take off your golden dress and give it to your sister. Then she took it off and put it on the black maiden, who gave her in exchange for it a shabby gray gown. They drove onwards, and a short time afterwards, the brother again cried, Cover thee well, my sister dear, that the rain may not wet thee, that the wind may not load thee with dust, that thou mayst be fair and beautiful, when thou appearest before the king. The bride asked, what is my dear brother saying? Oh, said the old woman. He says that you ought to take off your golden hood and give it to your sister. So she took off the hood and put it on her sister, and sat with her own head uncovered. And they drove on farther. After a while, the brother once more cried. Cover thee well, my sister dear, that the rain may not wet thee, that the wind may not load thee with dust, that thou mayst be fair and beautiful, when thou appearest before the king. The bride asked, What is my dear brother saying? Oh, said the old woman. He says you must look out of the carriage. They were, however, just on a bridge, which crossed deep water. When the bride stood up and leaned forward out of the carriage, they both pushed her out, and she fell into the middle of the water. At the same moment that she sank, a snow-white duck arose out of the mere smooth water and swam down the river. The brother had observed nothing of it and drove the carriage on until they reached the court. Then he took the black maiden to the king as his sister and thought she really was so because his eyes were dim 
and he saw the golden garments glittering. When the king saw the boundless ugliness of his intended bride, he was very angry and ordered the coachman to be thrown into a pit which was full of adders and nests of snakes. The old witch, however, knew so well how to flatter the king and deceive his eyes by her arts, that he kept her and her daughter until she appeared quite endurable to him, and he really married her. One evening when the black bride was sitting on the king's knee, a white duck came swimming up the gutter to the kitchen, and said to the kitchen boy, Boy, light a fire, that I may warm my feathers. The kitchen boy did it, and lighted a fire on the hearth. Then came the duck and sat down by it, and shook herself and smoothed her feathers to rights with her bill. While she was thus sitting and enjoying herself, she asked, What is my brother Regina doing? The scullery boy replied, He is imprisoned in the pit with adders and with snakes. Then she asked, What is the black witch doing in the house? The boy answered, She is loved by the king and happy. May God have mercy on him, said the duck and swam forth by the sink. The next night she came again and put the same question, and the third night also. Then the kitchen boy could bear it no longer, and went to the king and discovered all to him. The king, however, wanted to see it for himself, and next evening went thither, and when the duck thrust her head in through the sink, he took his sword and cut through her neck, and suddenly she changed into a most beautiful maiden exactly like the picture which her brother had made of her. The king was full of joy, and as she stood there quite wet, he caused splendid apparel to be brought and had her clothed in it. Then she told how she had been betrayed by cunning and falsehood, and at last thrown down into the water, and her first request was that her brother should be brought forth from the pit of snakes. And when the king had fulfilled this request, he went into the chamber where the old witch was, and asked, what does she deserve who does this and that? And related what had happened. Then was she so blinded that she was aware of nothing and said, She deserves to be stripped naked and put into a barrel with nails and that a horse should be harnessed to the barrel and the horse sent all over the world. All of which was done to her and to her black daughter. But the king married the white and beautiful bride and rewarded her faithful brother and made him a rich and distinguished man. The story serves as a warning about evaluating others based on appearance and social status rather than considering their true nature and virtuous qualities. Jealousy can lead to actions that harm others and, ultimately, become the cause of one's own downfall. In the story, the jealousy of the stepmother and stepsister resulted in an unforeseen consequence. The brother Regan demonstrates loyalty and ethical behavior in assisting his sister. He not only painted a portrait to remember his sister but also did everything possible to protect her in times of adversity. The Third Fairy Tale The Three Sluggards A certain king had three sons who were all equally dear to him, and he did not know which of them to appoint as his successor after his own death. When the time came when he was about to die, he summoned them to his bedside and said, Dear children, I have been thinking of something which I will declare unto you, whichsoever of you is the laziest shall have the kingdom. The eldest said, Then father, the kingdom is mine, for I am so idle that if I lie down to rest, and a drop falls in my, I will not open it that I may sleep. The second said, Father, the kingdom belongs to me. For I am so idle that when I am sitting by the fire warming myself, I would rather let my hill be burnt off than draw back my leg. The third said, Father, the kingdom is mine. For I am so idle that if I were going to be hanged, and had the rope already round my neck, and any one put a sharp knife into my hand with which I might cut the rope, I would rather let myself be hanged than raise my hand to the rope. When the father heard that, he said, Thou hast carried it the farthest, and shall be king. The narrative emphasizes the importance of accepting responsibility and duties, rejecting laziness, or avoiding responsibilities when faced with challenges. The story demonstrates that accepting and acknowledging one's flaws is crucial. The youngest son doesn't cover up but, instead, identifies and vocalizes his shortcomings. By illustrating humorous images of laziness, 
The story highlights that laziness can lead to negative consequences, even loss of power and responsibility. This is the end of the storytelling session. Do you like the stories I tell? Come back tomorrow to listen to fascinating fairy tales. Bye-bye!